June gad gathering. June, <laughs> not the June gathering. The monthly June, event. June monthly event. This is just Coke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Um, Growing Agile is our sponsor. We want to thank them. We'll thank them again later. Bye, and, strength. And our speaker, Pavel, he'll introduce himself. Thank you. Um, all right, welcome everyone. Um, so, uh, who am I? I'm Pavel, and I'm a Scrum Master and Agile coach at Yellowtail Software. Yellowtail Software is a small software development company with about 30 people who work for um, most of our customers actually in the Netherlands so um, who work mostly distributed have multiple distributed teams I, I do I have two teams I'm a scrum master for two teams we, we do um, uh, .NET software development web based and um, so I also coach um, our, my, my teams um, and also coach product owners uh, in Netherlands, um, and something I'm proud of this week, I got recently certified as a Scrum professional. Awesome. <laughs> so, so if you like what I say today, you can just follow me on Twitter. This below. So, um, so why do I have a picture of Las Vegas? Uh, well, I went to um, Scrum gathering uh, in the beginning of May. It was our biggest ever Scrum gathering with 500 people. Um, the previous ones were about 300, so um, lots of great people, lots of trainers, lots of you know thought leaders who who, who bring their the ideas and we share share our own ideas. Um, so I I decided to come back and um, and you know share it with you guys and um, so I selected uh, selected three uh, three biggest learnings and I thought you know to present it to you, but then. The first one was so big, so uh, I decided only to, to talk about Lean and Scrum today and how they how they interact with each other. What's the difference? And do you use Lean? Do you use Scrum? And um, so on. So, but let's start from the beginning. That's how many boarding pass you need to get in order to get to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we went to. Um, so it was myself and Alicia. Is Alicia somewhere? No, she had to leave. Oh, she had to leave. Um, so we're flying from Cape Town, Cape Town, London, London, um, Las, uh, London, Chicago, Chicago, Las Vegas, and Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, London, and London, uh, back to Cape Town. So, 36 <laughs> hours later, and uh, you can see the um, length of my legs. I, I can't really sleep, so I watched all the movies on, on British Airways and American Airlines. So. Um, the life of fire is really good. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I end up here, and um, this is not Paris, by the way. <laughs> but they've got everything. They've got, you know, the Eiffel Tower. They've, um, they've got New York uh, skyscrapers, and they actually took a roller coaster. That they actually have a real roller coaster in New York, New York Hotel. Uh, we were actually staying just around the corner. So um, we arrived there on Friday. Um, jet lagged, first, first time jet lagged for me, nine hours difference. The Saturday, um, the whole Saturday we spent just you know sleeping and eating and sleeping and more. Um, but on Sunday we just got to registration. They give you uh, a goodie bag, like some books, some program. Oh, this is me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is official Scrum Alliance name badge. This is Alicia. Um, one thing, I, so they give you a program. One thing I learned about, you know, the big conference like that, you should never select a topic based on on what you see in the program. You should always select a topic based on um, based on uh, people you know, the names, the good names. So who else was there? Peter, Peter, <laughs> his wife, yes. And this is Daniel, by the way. Daniel was a was a chair for for Scrum <coughs> in Las Vegas. So. So uh, Sunday we spent uh, registering and uh, Monday uh, the conference starts. So I don't know anyone except Alicia and Peter. So how do you get to know people? How do you, you know, how do you put out yourself out there? How do you, you know, meet, meet new people, share ideas? So the best way for me was to get on Twitter and you know follow this, this um, hashtag SGLasVegas, SGLas, and uh, one of the guys was saying. 
look, let's do link coffee. I said, oh, awesome. So I'm going to do on Monday, I'm going to go on Monday and, and, and um, join the link coffee. So I wake up at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, it was about 3 o'clock in, in the afternoon in, in, for me anyway. So, so I get to the shower and then I realize, wait, I don't know what link coffee is about. So, so I went quickly uh, on Google and checked. So link coffee is about three things. Mm -hmm. First, you need to set up a person. So this is a way to, link coffee is a way to uh, share ideas. It's kind of meet up, something um, similar to Agile Breakfast, which Karen and Sam do in, in Cape Town. But it's got more structure. So you have a Kanban board to do or uh, do and done. So you set up Kanban board, and then you uh, everyone kind of writes, writes the topics, um, what you want to talk about. And then you, you vote on it. And let's say you can use the dot vote, um, two dot the two dots each, each, and then you kind of create a backlog of items, and and you discuss each each topic for five minutes, and then you can use a thumb vote. Yes, I want to talk more about it. Um, I don't know, and let's move on. And if if people want to talk more about it, you just give it another two minutes or so. So that's about lean coffee. Um, so. Every time I go to the conference, I try to think at the end of three biggest learnings for me um, at this conference. And two out, out of the three biggest learnings actually came from Lean Coffee. So if you have a problem, or if something you know, bothers you at work, and you're looking for some experience or someone who actually had it before and knows the solution, uh, this, is a great, this is a great place um, to discuss it. And, um, there's actually link off in, in South Africa. So um, in Cape Town, Karen and Sam Groen and Ajao are doing it. And Cliff also started in Johannesburg. The next date, if you want to join it, it's on 12th of June in Cape Town, and I assume it's nine, 19th of June in, in Johannesburg. I think they're doing it twice, twice a week. Oh, twice a month. Every, every twice a month. Um, so if you want to know more about it, there's a linkoffee.org, and I think it's Cape Town, the link coffee for Cape Town one. All right, so we finished Link Coffee, we went to opening keynotes, and this is Jeff Sutherland. So he did open keynotes. Who's Jeff Sutherland? He is actually one of two creators of Scrum. What was different to, to his talk this time is that he actually talked a lot about Lean. And it actually felt like Scrum and Lean are actually in love with each other, and Scrum is Lean. Um, and uh, he was talking a lot about Kaizen. Kaizen is Japanese for continuous improvement. So something is happening in, in Scrum world right now. Something is happening where Lean is actually taking you know portion of Scrum in, in Agile. So let's have a look. Is it is it Lean versus Scrum, or is it um, Lean and Scrum? So Jeff was actually saying you know Lean and Scrum, um, the the whole, it's a whole thing. It's a kind kind of complements each other. So. Let's let's try to figure it out. Oh, by the way, that's how I got invited to to Larry King show. <laughs> 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 um, so what's lean? Um, so lean came from uh, lean manufacturing. It's uh, so you probably know that it all came from Toyota, and Toyota has you know the big plants producing producing you know our cars, and if if something stops then it's a huge loss for the company. So if, you know, if it stops at a certain point and starts to create defects at a certain point, then, um, then you, 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 you assume a big loss. So they, they came up with um, seven different types of waste and they came up with the idea that you actually need to, to eliminate this waste. Well, while we don't produce cars in, in software development, we also have waste and um, and lean thinking in software, lean, lean thinking evolved into software, and, and people came up with uh, seven seven principles. Let's go with, um, with the seven principles. So the first one is eliminating waste. What type of waste do we have in uh, in software development? Well, lots lots of it. So we have we have um, unwanted features which, which which we don't use. We have untested untested software which we need to test again. We have really bad communication, which which also costs us a lot of a lot of um, money and time. So the second one in 
Lean in software, de uh, software development is amplifying learning. So, uh, in order for us, in order for us to 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 get this this great software to the market, we need to learn how to build it. And the faster we learn, then the better software gets. Then um, the third principle is design as late as possible. So the reason why you don't want to decide. In, you know, right now for two years up front is because then you're going to make lots of assumptions. Mm -hmm. In order to eliminate these assumptions, you, uh, Lean says, let's decide this as late as possible. Let's only decide for, for, for next two, two weeks, next months. Um, the next one is deliver as fast as possible. Why do we want to do that? Uh, and the reason is we're not only ones on the market, and um, we need to get feedback as soon as possible. We need to know how good is our product, our, our products. And for example, um, if we if you compare MTN Vodacom and Cell C, uh, and MTN spends a year on on a, on a project to deliver some product, and six months in this project, Vodacom comes with some comes with some better offer. What do you do? Do you just you know throw away the whole six months of project? Or do you do you adapt to that? Um, <coughs> the next one is empowering the team. So I sometimes hear a lot of people uh, calling developers resources, and they're really not resources. If they were resources, we would have a box of developers. And do you, you know? Do you plug and play? Just plug and play two developers I here, <laughs> three developers there. You know, what, one tester or we, we're not delivering in time, let's just to put two more. Does it work? Well, it doesn't. So um, so we want to empower a team. We want to give them freedom. We want to hire good professionals who can take care of, of building the right software, build, building good quality products. Um, so using all the previous five principles, you um, you can deliver something, you know, fast and and may, it might be even cheap. But is it a good quality software? Did we think about um, scalability? Did we think about maintainability? Is it efficient software? So we also need to think about integrity built within 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 our products. And the seventh one, seventh one is see the whole. So uh, again, if you look, you know, MTN, Vodacom, you actually need to know about your competitors, you need to know what your company is doing at you know, strategic level. Um, so uh, you, you need to look <coughs> beyond your project. You need to see the whole <coughs> future and the whole, maybe whole industry even. So based on this information, based on the seven principles, is, uh, is it a competitive um, framework? Is it a competitive you know, methodology? Should we you know, swap Scrum for Lean because Lean is better? Okay, let's, let's have a look at those principles again. So, eliminate waste. Um, how, how do we eliminate waste in, how do we eliminate waste in Scrum? So, we have all these meetings, we, um, we find that Having the switch meetings is going to produce good quality requirements, and we don't need to spend a lot of time discussing those requirements, and we actually build in the right product. Uh, amplifying learning. We have we have two meetings in Scrum. First one is a sprint review, and second one is a retrospective. So a sprint review gives us uh, feedback on on our product, so we can learn from it, and we can do it even better. And uh, sprint retrospective gives us feedback on how team is, is doing in terms of software development and what can we do better and what can we learn from that. We can learn um, pair programming, for example, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna amplify our learning in, in Scrum. Decide as late as possible. Um, we only need to plan for the next sprint and anything can change for, for, you know, in, for the future sprints. We can change our backlog, rearrange some features, take something out, put new stuff in it. So, in Scrum, you you only obliged to have you know defined work, defined plan for the next iteration, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So you can decide late. 
deliver as fast as possible well shippable software to the end of each iteration. Um, um, so it's quite fast. So compared to what we were doing five years ago, they would have a release plan uh, for the next two years and they would maybe ship each version each year and have an office 2000, and, you know, 2007, 2010, right? So it's three years between projects. So right now we're thinking, okay, so we're gonna, right now we have a Google um, Chrome which is version of what, 97 right now. So <coughs> it's not IE8, IE7, and the three, three, three year difference be uh, between that. So we need to deliver as fast as possible and we can do it using Scrum. And part of the team, well, we, we all know about self-organization. Um, so we all know about the value of team taking ownership and responsibility within the Scrum team. Uh, build integrity within, we also try to bring all the agile, agile practices to work in, in our team to improve the quality um, of our software efficiency and bring, uh, have, have our software maintainable. And see the whole, we have a product vision and our product owner actually helps us to see the whole in Scrum. So, is Scrum lean? Uh, yes it is, but Lean actually gives you more. So even though in Scrum we deliver as fast as possible, but it's only two, two weeks. So let's say customer comes back with another requirement in the middle of the sprint. The only, the only, um, the, the only next checkpoint where you can deliver this requirement, if it's the top priority, it's gonna be end of the sprint plus another sprint. So it's, well, at least maybe three weeks. So is it fast? It's probably not as fast as industry, you know, wants us to be. Um, see, uh, amplify learning, we're only limited to, to, uh, to retrospectives and sprint reviews. At certain, you know, at certain point we say, that's not enough for my team to, to improve. We need to improve on a daily basis. Surely, surely a feedback loop is amplify learning and a stand-up is feedback loop. Yeah, 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 the, there is certain level of there is, there is already lean thinking within Scrum, but when you reach, uh, you know, in Scrum sometimes we say, you know, we have a great Scrum team, so we're kind of stable. Um, customers are happy. We have a stable velocity. Um, we, are, you know, team is happy as well. They they feel like you know, they're really working towards it, but. Your velocity is stable, so your, your velocity is not improving. At certain point, you're going to start looking into: Is it good enough? Can we, can you know, can we get even more value out of this team? Can we, can we, uh, you know, build even better product? Get, get even more value from the product as well. <coughs> so, which kind of brought me to an idea that Scrum is is more about the value-driven software development, and the focus there is on is on value. And we can still use Lean to help us to optimize this process. So why don't we just continue to use Scrum, go back to these seven checkpoints, and check, oh, oh do, we, do we eliminate enough waste in our Scrum? Can we, can we just get rid of more waste there? So and then well, that's where you, you can actually use Lean thinking to optimize Scrum even better. Scrum is ultimately, you know, becomes a, a process for you. When you're stable, you just go through a routine of, you know, meetings, more, you know, the retrospectives, the new iteration, more software on the market. Um, so I'll give you an example of, I'll give you three examples of, of applying lean thinking to, to Scrum. So something's called uh, product backlog iceberg. Uh, something many of us are already doing. So you, on top of that, you have well-defined, maybe refined, maybe you even have a backlog room in session three times, <coughs> uh, and you have like a small stories, one, two, three points, or maybe maybe thirteen, like on the picture. But you, you don't want to refine, you don't want this level of details in your backlog, which is a thousand points long, right? So what you're going to have in the middle of the, of the backlog, so you kind of, for iteration number four to number 10, 
you're going to have, okay, this feature is about 34 points. We talked about it. We've got a rough estimation from the team. And at the bottom of this iceberg, you're going to have epics. You're going to have something which you know you're probably going to build, but you don't want to go, go into details for that. And the reason why you don't want to go into details for that is because you want to um, eliminate waste. You don't want to get all these meetings, and you don't want to talk to you don't want to talk to your team uh, for features which might not be even the case in, in six months' time or, or a year time. So this is one of the examples of applying lean thinking. The other example of, of lean thinking is actually TDD. There is no, there is no <coughs> TDD there in, in, in the original Scrum. So TDD is one of the agile principles. And what it helps you to do, it helps you to eliminate waste because you don't need to retest features every time. You don't need to go through regression tests. You don't need to spend a sprint, stabilizing sprint at the end of each release. Um, and it also helps you to build integrity within. So you know that quality of your software software is is, uh, is really is really good because it tested. There is a I don't know, ninety five percent coverage. And um, in order for you not to have a release like that with a lot of smoke around it and you know uh, two years of preparations to build this rocket, you want to go into continuous delivery and uh, these companies like Facebook and Twitter. You know, deploy in every, every you know 30 times a day. So, so and the reason why they want to do that, they want to get features as as, as fast as, as possible to the market. So, Lean and Kanban. Let's have a look. So Kanban's got their <coughs> own list of principles, and this is a list of their principles. So it's visualize, limit work in progress, manage flow, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops, and improve co uh, collaboration. <laughs> Improve collaboratively. Yeah. <laughs> so look, let's look at uh, limit work in progress. Thinking behind it is to <clears throat> to uh, minimize waste. Uh, to you know make sure that features done one thing at a time, so you don't have many things uh, in progress and nothing in done. So you kind of this moment where you have ten features in progress and nothing in done, all these ten features are considered waste because you didn't really get anything to the customer. So, it brings me to a second idea that we cannot actually do Lean, because Lean on, is not a framework itself, but we can use Lean to improve our process, existing process. So we can start with waterfall, whatever it is right now, and start focusing on, on eliminating waste there. If we if we already scrum, if we already can ban, and when that, why don't we take you know it, it even further? So uh, I had lots of you know great talks about it, and I was like, oh, that's 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 awesome idea. So I said, okay, let's go gamble. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Las Vegas. Um, everyone was telling me that you you have to go and gamble in Las Vegas. Why? I don't want to waste. My money. I, I, I want to spend my money. So the gambling is wasting. Everyone knows that you know these mathematical algorithms, which you know make you lose you know 10% of you know you always lose something. So, but anyway, so you you in Las Vegas, you have to, to to gamble. So peer pressure forced me into to losing 30 dollars, quite 300 rand. So I lost it within 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so Alicia is sitting next to me. So she, she, she managed to do like an hour. So for 45 minutes, I was just checking Alicia's screen. <laughs> so they, the reason why I lost quicker probably is because they can actually press a button. And the button is, you know, you kind of place a bet much quicker. And Alicia was actually using the thing. So mm. okay, every time you, you bet, you actually need to, to, you know, pull that thing. So. One of the buzzwords right now is lean startup. With that. So, what what's lean startup then? Um, is it is it a methodology itself? So lean thinking is not methodology. It's it's just a way of you know thinking and improving the process. So maybe lean startup is a um, is a framework for us. Um, let me start from here. So, in cases we know our problem and we know our solution. The most obvious way is actually to go with waterfall. Let me give you an example. For example, um, 
we have a thousand people working for our company, and we sometimes we need to get the cell phone numbers or email addresses. And we just want to build a SharePoint portal, a SharePoint page to get these details. So we know our problem, we don't so we don't have easy access to this information, and we have no solution. We want to get this page. So why would we go through troubles of sprint plannings and you know backlogs and burn down charts? It's gonna take us two weeks. So waterfall. The other way of you know the other situation is problem is known, solution is unknown. Uh, example of that, something we, uh, we did at Yellowtail, uh, it's a system for roadworks in, in Amsterdam. They had a problem that they had unsynchronized roadworks. So, so someone would dig a hole, you know, put some cables, put it back, and another company comes next day and you know, digs the same hole, <laughs> put some more cables. So, it's, you know, it's uh, something that we do in Cape Town anyway. So, we build, so next next to me, we build it in my city bus, and then they come put some <coughs> more pipes, and then they decide they need to put a sign. So they do it three times. So we have a problem. So we want to come up with a solution, but don't, we don't really know what actually market wants. What type of software? What type of software do, do we uh, do we need to build for that? Yeah. And do we really need the software? So they started with Scrum. We started with Scrum. So eventually we built Roadworks. Then we came up with permits. So you would need, um, so certain organization would need a permit to do roadwork in a specific area. Then you would come up with special areas like historical sites. You, you, you can ne never do roadworks there you know, without special approval. And then eventually they would come up with, with Google Maps and GIS. And now they have a nice, nice picture of Amsterdam with all these roadwork signs there. And, but it, it didn't. They didn't plan for it. They didn't have a solution for that upfront. And they would have to make lots of assumptions upfront in order to come up with a solution. So it would probably be very costly and create lots of waste. So Scrum, Kanban, XP, um, really great is uh, in solving, solving this situation. And then we come with situations like we don't really know the problem. You say, well, you say, how is it possible? But what about in you know companies trying to do innovation? What about startups? What about Groupon? So they never came up. They never thought that you know having manicure and pedicure special for two prices is a problem. So they had to discover that. Now this guy Eric came up with a lean startup idea, and he actually wrote a book it's called it "Hard Days Entrepreneurs Use Continuous Innovation." to create a radically successful business. So the key word there is continuous innovation. How do we actually implement continuous innovation? So the first, the first idea that he came up with is minimum viable product. Why, why if you try to innovate, if you try to have a learning experience, experiment, why do you build a huge monster with all these features, half of them never going to be used? Well, in fact, there's a chart on the internet. 50% of features are never used, 25 are used rarely, and what, about 10% only used you know, uh, uh, often. So, so just, build, just build just enough to get to the market and see you know, how, you know, what type of response you're going to get. Is, uh, and maybe adjust later. So one of the ways to, to come up with the minimum viable product is called Lean Canvas, where you kind of, you can, you can use a whiteboard, you just draw it on a whiteboard. You come up with three, three problems, you identify three possible solutions for that, you, uh, you come up with metrics, uh, figure out the unique value propositions, then fill in unfair advantages which you have or, or don't have. <coughs> the channels, <coughs> the channels is how you're going to reach to your, to your customers and the customer segment is the actual customers you, uh, you're trying to target. And at the bottom is a, the cost structure and revenue streams. So on the left side there's a product uh, related stuff and the right side is a, is a market related stuff. If you do this exercise you, you can come up with a minimum viable product which you, which you build. 
which you can build and you know get to the market as soon as possible. The, I'm going to go through two extreme examples of minimal viable product. One is called smoke test product. So it's it's a smoke test product. So you just create lots of smoke and see if anyone reacts to that. So example of that would be have a have a um, have a lots of Google Ads link into your website, which on your website you just you just say, we're, you know, we're thinking about making these products. If you're interested, leave us your contact details or, or pre-order something and we'll get back to you. And then just measure number of clicks. <coughs> so they want to know if this, if this, if this product is going to, you know, is popular, is, is there interest in the market for that? So an example of that, uh, I have a business plan of, of making square bananas, <laughs> and I think I think that square, uh, you know, I can reduce cost of shipping and you know <laughs> logistics by you know packaging the square bananas in the box nicely. Uh, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be you know if people really like square bananas. I don't know. Do you like square bananas? So uh, I put um, I put Google Ads on the page saying pre-order of uh, a box of square bananas by 1st of August it's going to be at your house and I measure how many actually clicked in that time. I'm going to measure a click-through rate, I'm going to measure how many people actually left their emails, how many people pre-ordered that. The second one is deploy first and code later. Um, so what did that, so, so I tried to get an example, this is a real life example, they all, they're really hard to get though because you can only catch those features while they're in deploy first, but not yet coded. So this website got a button called uh, Rewards. When you click on this button, they say feature is coming soon. Mm -hmm. So why would they do that? Why would they put a feature there which is not there yet? So they actually measure a number of clicks for their users to see if how many people actually are interested in rewards and should we actually build rewards? So should we have a business model behind it? So, uh, isn't it just like TDD? So where you create test first and then you create code for it. So TDD for everyone. If you think um, you know deploy first, code later is crazy. Then, uh, five years ago, people thought that TDD is crazy as well. So don't you need code first to write your unit tests? So so you've got your minimal viable product. You kind of you figure out what it is. You you build it. So what do you want to do next? So you actually want to measure something. You want to measure how successful it's on the market. Um, there's, there's always a good metric, there's always a bad metric. Um, so you need to, you need to be uh, aware of vanity metrics. Example of vanity metrics. Um, let's say my website is measuring the number of uh, new users. But, uh, but how I get this new users, I put an ad on Google Ads, and each click cost me $2, and um, each hundred person actually goes to the website and log in and create, you know, pays me money. So, uh, so they pay me $50 for, for a subscription. So I just spent $200 on one user, and, uh, which is going to bring me back $50. So is it a good metric? Probably not. But does it look good on paper? Uh, absolutely. I have this new user rocketing. Let's put more money into. Let's put more money into, you know, Google Ads. So, example of a good metric. Uh, a technique called split testing. So, you split your user group into half or maybe ten percent, ninety percent, and you deploy a new feature only to to one half. And, and the other half doesn't have this feature. So over, over a period of time, you measure did profitability increase for this group with new feature, or did it stay the same, or did it increase? And then you kind of roll it out, develop, develop like it, it more. So, and the third one, so once you got this data, you actually, you don't want to start there. So you got your minimal viable product, probably makes you money, but you know, you want to make more money. So so you want to come up with more ideas, and but based based on this learning experiments you already ran, so you 
you amplified your learning. So you know better, you know your, you know your market, you know your customer better. Um, so which, which brings us to this diagram. You can find it on the internet. It goes through build, goes through measure, it goes, uh, and it goes through learn. So you build a product, you measure and get some data, and you generate more ideas. There is an exit lane here. If, um, if your learning experience didn't work out, at least you didn't spend a year on building that. So you can just go to, to the next one. Okay, so, so this is lean thinking. And what about Scrum? Where is Scrum here? So it's here in build. So you can actually use the building part of, of, of lean startup. Uh, you can imp you implement Scrum there. You can actually build your minimal viable product, you have a backlog there, go through the backlog, couple of iterations, and then go through a bigger circle for your product circle. So this is a process circle, just to get to get the product out, and you still need to to um, have measure and no. Right, recap. This is not a real guide, by the way. <laughs> um, so, Lean thinking will help you to optimize your process. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can do waterfall, you can do scrum, you can do Kanban. Lean thinking is a checklist of things, and uh, you can you can do better by by applying applying those uh, uh, those uh, principles. Lean startup will help you to to run new experiments. Will help help you to run new. Uh, the learning experience will help you to uh, uh, amplify learning. And Lean Coffee will help you to meet new people and, and, and share your knowledge. So, and well, Scrum is part of all of that. You can, you can talk about Scrum at Lean Coffee, you can, um, you can use Scrum for your Lean Startup, and you can use Lean Thinking on top of your, of your Scrum process. So, the main part is, is, is done. I'm going to share the nine ideas very quickly I, I brought back from Las Vegas. So there's a, I met a guy who, who he gave me a business card and the business card was saying senior, uh, senior cat so he, I know who that is. Yes, it's Harvard. <laughs> yes, so um, there is a position like that in America, so if, in case you want to so I guess they have a uh, junior cat herders as well. <laughs> so hell day, something I've learned. So what people call a hell day in Scrum is when you schedule all your meetings on one day, in one day. <laughs> that, that's a hell day for you. Um, there's uh, um, Scrum and short term projects. How uh, can you actually do Scrum? So. Uh, when I went to Las Vegas, I was kind of saying, I was saying to Karen, you know, a couple of weeks before that, Scrum looks, you know, seems heavy. What if I need to do a project which is one month, months long? Hard, but I need three sprints at least to get, you know, historical velocity and, you know, to, to, to draw my nice charts. Can I really do Scrum in short-term projects? And then, um, and then the guy was saying, yes, why not? Why don't you just have a one-day iteration? Okay, so let's let's have a look. So two weeks sprint, sprint review one hour, respective two hours, sprint plane one hour, sprint plane two hours, daily scrum 15 minutes. Okay, let's scale it down to one day. You start your day with 30 minutes sprint planning two, 30 minutes sprint planning two, uh, uh, sprint plane one, 30 minutes sprint planning two, run for a day, at the end of the day you have a sprint review and then retrospective. So you might not have daily scrum, you might not need daily scrum, you might have hourly scrum. <laughs> anyway, so close your mind, don't do it. When you're ready, you're gonna, you're gonna use it. So number four, um, so I've, I've heard people talking about two, two monsters. Um, <laughs> water scrum for and then scrum ban. Those are very nice monsters. But if I saw this monster in real life, I would be really scared, you know, to have this dude, you know, standing here. So the same with those things. 
they m might be nice on paper, but when you when you meet them in real life, they're not very nice. So what does what does crown fall is when you do lots of planning up front, then you run for a couple of sprints, and then you have a long process of accepting your product. What does crown ban is? Know what's going on, but <laughs> <laughs> so um, number five, <coughs> I spoke to Lisa Atkins. She she's a trainer for trainers for for Scrum trainers. So um, she was saying, you know, we kind of when we came up with Scrum, we didn't check away project managers. Project managers actually stay. Checked away business analysis, and we you know we replaced them with product owner. And, and Scrum Master, but when we get to big corporates and you know sophisticated domains, we feel a need for that. But obviously they don't call call it the same name, so they call it value management. So you can call your business uh, analyst now value managers. Um, <laughs> five wise, it's something I knew before that, but it was very popular. Three session out of seven, I went to. We're actually talking about five wise. So what's a 5Y is a root cause analysis. When you have a problem, you, you probably shouldn't try to fix um, this, you know, the, this is a problem because it's not a problem actually, it's a symptom of something which lies underneath. So if you say, well, I have a bad quality, you know, my developers writing bad quality code, then you, instead of trying to, you know, you know replace developers, you might ask a question, why? And you go through five whys, and eventually you get to um, to um, to the actual root. So I'll give you. It actually came from Toyota. This one. This one. So they they would say, my vehicle will not start. And then you ask why. The battery is dead. And you ask why. Well, alternator is not functioning. Okay, why? Uh, alternator belt is broken. Okay, why? And belt was. Beyond, you know, beyond repair, this you know, lifetime, and the last why would be, well, it hasn't been serviced. So your problem is actually not, you're not not the bad vehicle, but your problem is a bad owner who actually didn't service service his car. So I uh, I, I use it sometimes. It's you know, in, in practice, it's very difficult to kill yourself in uh, in you focus yourself. On the problem, sometimes it goes, you know, wise go go sideways, sideways. So you need to really keep focus on and get into the root cause. It's avoided a bit because it tends to lead to upper management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it goes. Um, number seven. <coughs> what we do in retrospect is we 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 put it we put it on our board or we have a board. What went wrong? What went well? Uh, we, we kind of come with, come up with stickies. We we figuring out what really what went really wrong. Come up with actions. But when I'm thinking about lean, uh, if you want to apply lean thinking, then you want to focus on future. You want to get your your team to the future, not in the past. What happened in the past happened in the past. Um, so I came back uh, to South Africa, and instead of these two columns, I had one. So what are we missing? It actually came up. They actually came up with different. From it came up from different angle. It came up with different actions for for this team. So especially if you have a stable team, nothing goes wrong. But but deep inside you feel well, they they can be better. So so in order to figure out how they can be better, try to focus your perspective on, on future rather, rather than past. Um, it's, a, it's a unfortunate that retrospective, but the reference here that kind of implies that you need to only need to look at what went wrong. Um, Jeff Salinger mentioned that Scrum Master needs to double your production of, of the team and product owners to double return per, per user story. I had a revenue, but then I kind of, not every Scrum project uh, needs a revenue, so, so I used the return instead. So, very, very interesting way to look at that, and very interesting way to look at you know the positions. Does does my scrum master really double my production, or he he's doing line management? Does my product owner really double my uh, returns? 
And <laughs> apparently, well, SEP is a big organization, they also go, go into the transformation. So they hired the Scrum Pop. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, you know, the Scrum Pop doesn't excommunicate teams from, from Scrum and sells <laughs> in services and, you know, and maybe he wears his, his fancy hat. But anyway, so this is number nine. Um, this is the end. And we have five minutes for questions. And this is my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>